Dear Valued Customer, Would you like to discover a shortcut to learning and being ready for artificial intelligence in digital marketing? If so, pay close attention to this very limited, special offer. You will only see this once. First off, thanks so much for purchasing the guide that will teach you all the skills you need to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence in digital marketing. If you follow the step-by-step -step guide, you'll be heading straight to that goal. But what if you could do it even faster? And what if you could ensure that you get the absolute best results possible and stay focused? In short, making sure that this is a real success. Now, the good news is that you can. For a limited time, you can get access to the video upgrade to the guide you just purchased at a very low price. This powerful upgrade will make it easier to get started and stay committed to your ultimate goal. Just to be clear, this is an exclusive upgrade for customers only. Why do you need to upgrade to the video version of Artificial Intelligence and Digital Marketing Guide? Did you know that most people learn a lot faster when they see something being done on video other than just by reading about it? That's because most people out there are visual learners. How do you normally learn the best? Although the guide you just purchased gives you a step-by-step -step approach to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing, experience tells us that it requires learners to pay very close attention to the details to get the best results possible. If you miss any of the most important details or do things the wrong way, you may miss out on the full benefits offered inside the guide. For that very reason, I've put together a video version to make it easier to get positive results quickly. The video version of the guide you just purchased will help you. Avoid missing any important key details that you might miss by only reading the guide. Stay focused and accountable and follow through and make sure you get ongoing results. Ensure that the work you put in now keeps on giving you benefits long into the future. Introducing Artificial Intelligence in Digital Marketing Video Course. Are you ready to learn all the skills you need to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing a lot faster? If the answer is yes, click the link below. Of course, you're probably wondering how much this is going to cost, right? First off, cost is the wrong word. This upgrade is an investment that will pay for itself many times over. This is the next best thing to having an expert on the subject right beside you, showing you how it's done. Of course, hiring an expert would easily set you back hundreds of dollars. Luckily, you're not going to have to invest anywhere near that today to get the next best thing. Not only will you avoid many of the most common mistakes that people make when trying to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing, you'll notice immediate positive results in your achievements. And it's about to get even better. When you upgrade today, you'll also get this exclusive fast action bonus, fast action bonus, high quality MP3s of the entire video version of the training, valued at $27. Don't have time to watch videos? I'm also providing you with 10 MP3s that you can use while you're on the go. Listen to them in the car, at home, or even at the office. All day, every day. And here's what's really great about this. You don't have to decide anything today. You get a full 30 days to go through the video training and decide if this is really for you. If for any reason or no reason at all, you're not 100% satisfied with everything you get inside, simply let me know and I'll refund every penny of your tiny investment, no questions asked. Here's how to get instant access to the video version today. Simply click the link below, enter your information, and you'll get instant access to the entire video training version plus the Fast Action Bonus MP3s. But please don't wait. You must grab this right now. In fact, if you close this page, you may never have the opportunity to upgrade to the video version of this ever again at an investment this low. Are you ready to make things happen a lot faster? If you prefer to learn by being shown how to do something and you want to get results quickly, this is for you. If you're really serious about how artificial intelligence will transform digital marketing and how to be ready, this is for you. And if you're one of those people that's a visual learner, you need this. Here's to becoming the most productive you that you can be. Remember, if you close this page, you may never see this again at such a low investment. There's no risk. Try this out for 30 days and then decide if it's for you. It doesn't get any easier than that. Dear Valued Customer, Would you like to discover a shortcut to learning and being ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing? If so, pay close attention to this very limited, special offer. You will only see this once. First off, thanks so much for purchasing the guide that will teach you all the skills you need to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing. If you follow the step-by-step -step guide, you'll be heading straight to that goal. But what if you could do it even faster? And what if you could ensure that you get the absolute best results possible and stay focused? In short, making sure that this is a real success. Now, the good news is that you can. For a limited time, you can get access to the video upgrade to the guide you just purchased at a very low price. 
This powerful upgrade will make it easier to get started and stay committed to your ultimate goal. Just to be clear, this is an exclusive upgrade for customers only. Why do you need to upgrade to the video version of Artificial Intelligence and Digital Marketing Guide? Did you know that most people learn a lot faster when they see something being done on video other than just by reading about it? That's because most people out there are visual learners. How do you normally learn the best? Although the guide you just purchased gives you a step-by-step -step approach to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing, experience tells us that it requires learners to pay very close attention to the details to get the best results possible. If you miss any of the most important details or do things the wrong way, you may miss out on the full benefits offered inside the guide. For that very reason, I've put together a video version to make it easier to get positive results quickly. The video version of the guide you just purchased will help you. Avoid missing any important key details that you might miss by only reading the guide. Stay focused and accountable and follow through and make sure you get ongoing results. Ensure that the work you put in now keeps on giving you benefits long into the future. Introducing Artificial Intelligence in Digital Marketing Video Course. Are you ready to learn all the skills you need to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing a lot faster? If the answer is yes, click the link below. Of course, you're probably wondering how much this is going to cost, right? First off, cost is the wrong word. This upgrade is an investment that will pay for itself many times over. This is the next best thing to having an expert on the subject right beside you, showing you how it's done. Of course, hiring an expert would easily set you back hundreds of dollars. Luckily, you're not going to have to invest anywhere near that today to get the next best thing. Not only will you avoid many of the most common mistakes that people make when trying to learn and be ready for artificial intelligence and digital marketing, you'll notice immediate positive results in your achievements. And it's about to get even better. When you upgrade today, you'll also get this exclusive fast action bonus, fast action bonus, high quality MP3s of the entire video version of the training valued at $27. Don't have time to watch videos? I'm also providing you with 10 MP3s that you can use while you're on the go. Listen to them in the car, at home, or even at the office. All day. Every day. And here's what's really great about this. You don't have to decide anything today. You get a full 30 days to go through the video training and decide if this is really for you. If for any reason or no reason at all, you're not 100% satisfied with everything you get inside, simply let me know and I'll refund every penny of your tiny investment. No questions asked. Here's how to get instant access to the video version today. Simply click the link below, enter your information, and you'll get instant access to the entire video training version plus the Fast Action Bonus MP3s. But please don't wait. You must grab this right now. In fact, if you close this page, you may never have the opportunity to upgrade to the video version of this ever again at an investment this low. Are you ready to make things happen a lot faster? If you prefer to learn by being shown how to do something and you want to get results quickly, this is for you. If you're really serious about how artificial intelligence will transform digital marketing and how to be ready, this is for you. And if you're one of those people that's a visual learner, you need this. Here's to becoming the most productive you that you can be. Remember, if you close this page, you may never see this again at such a low investment. There's no risk. Try this out for 30 days and then decide if it's for you. It doesn't get any easier than that. Chatbots. Chatbots are an increasingly popular tool for marketers, business owners, and webmasters. So what is a chatbot? Essentially, a chatbot is a minuscule AI that will normally live on a website and will which then be able to answer questions and engage in basic conversation. Very often, chatbots are used in customer service. This way, a website can answer commonly asked questions and significantly lighten the load on its customer service team. The company can provide the support it wants to for its buyers without spending a huge amount on extra members of staff and call centers. But a chatbot can be much more than just customer support. Chatbots are just as effective in marketing and can be extremely effective at increasing sales and profits. Chatbots are particularly effective at kickstarting a sales process by welcoming visitors to a website and asking them what they're looking for. Instead of relying on UX to try and guide the visitor to the right part of the page, a chatbot can instead simply ask what they are hoping to buy and then take them to that page. What's more is that it can provide useful recommendations, perhaps informed by previous buying history, and it can reduce any concerns that users might have. Chatbots can even get information from customers by asking them their budget or what it is they're looking for. Even if they don't buy, you now understand their intent and you can use this information to hone your marketing strategy further. 
Some pundits argue that in the next few years, 85% of business might be done through chatbots. So how can you get started? 80% of businesses say they want chatbots in place by 2020. Facebook chatbots. One option is to invest in a Facebook chatbot. There are plenty of sites and services online that will sell these for you. Facebook Messenger is a new frontier for a lot of small businesses. While it has crept under the radar for many marketers, the numbers speak for themselves. Facebook Messenger is currently used by over 1.2 billion people. That's 11% of the entire human population. And what makes Messenger even more powerful is that it can be embedded into your website. Over 20 million pages use messaging and that number is growing. This provides a very simple and easy way to communicate with your visitors, to answer their queries, and to help convert traffic into sales. But you can't be available 24-7 to cater to all your visitors' needs, and this is where a chatbot comes in. This is a basic AI that can tend to your customers and help to provide a more personal experience while answering basic questions. This is a hugely powerful tool for businesses as it means you'll no longer lose visitors that struggle to find their way around the website or to get the information they need. Imagine if customers could order food by just sending a Facebook message and then answering a few automated questions. Or what if a business could access your expert legal advice without ever needing to speak to you in person? All of this is possible in the near future. Facebook chatbots can even be proactive by sending messages to potential customers. You need to be extremely careful with this, seeing as it can be seen as spam. But if you have an automated system that's able to reach out to potential buyers at just the right time with a carefully crafted message, this can be huge for business. Other types of chatbot. Of course, not all chatbots are Facebook chatbots. There are many other ways to implement chatbots into a website, from creating them from scratch using homemade software, to using them to respond to emails or SMS. Developing your AI skills using SQL. If you want to ensure you aren't left behind by developments in AI and machine learning, then it may pay to learn relevant skills that you can use to implement your own strategies. At least by understanding the tools used in AI and machine learning, you will be able to navigate these new horizons and make smarter decisions for your business. One of the key concepts to understand then is SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language and is a declarative language that is used to store and retrieve information from a database. If that sounds like gobbledygook, it basically provides a set of commands you can use to manipulate large data sets. SQL is crucial for data science and machine learning. It takes a number of forms, such as MySQL, SQL Server, and SQL Lite. Each uses a slightly different dialect to achieve the same thing, interact with relational databases. Relational databases consist of numerous tables like you see in Excel, with columns and rows. So if you had a lot of visitors to your website, you might fill out their data across rows, such as name, age, contact details, etc. Pull out any given visitor, and it will bring their details up so that you're ready to call them and market to them. SQL then allows you to do things like creating whole new tables or inserting new rows, columns, or cells. You can do this with simple commands like create table and insert into. To make a new database, you first need to use a command to make it, and from there, you can then begin inserting tables like so. One of the most powerful commands is something called select, which allows you to retrieve information across one or more tables. For instance, you can use this to get the details of anyone over a certain age, like so. Group by is a command that lets you group results according to certain conditions. Cursors let us move through sets of data and make changes. While this all might seem quite simple, combined with huge amounts of data, these simple commands can yield fascinating results and be extremely useful in informing future decisions. This is essential how machine learning works. And if you ever want to work as a data scientist to employ big data solutions or machine learning applications, this is what you will need to know. Email marketing. The key to success on the web is not just to gain traffic, but also to control that traffic. What does that mean? It means that you need to know how to decide which of your visitors you want to talk to at any time. It means that you need to understand your visitors and to know what they are thinking, what their moods are, and what they're interested in at any given time. And it means you need to know how and when to strike when it comes to selling products or encouraging people to sign up to your mailing list. This is a theme we've seen come up time and again with machine learning and AI. And email marketing is no different. You can do all this by building a mailing list and then segmenting that list. First, let's go over the basics of email marketing again for those that aren't familiar. Email marketing is, of course, the process of marketing via email. In other words, this means you're going to be building a big list, a collection of emails, 
And you'll do this by asking visitors to your site to share their contact details when they land on your homepage. This in turn requires an autoresponder. An autoresponder is a tool that you use to create email forms and then to manage all of the contacts on your list. You can use the form somewhere on your page to let people input their details and you'll use the autoresponder to actually send all your emails. It should be immediately apparent what the value of this is. Sending all your emails manually using Gmail or another web client is not easy and would likely result in many not getting delivered. You'd have to send lots of different emails for longer lists and you'd need to manually manage any requests to subscribe or unsubscribe. An autoresponder manages all of that for you, so you just need to write one email and then click send. The other benefit of an autoresponder is that it can collect data for you and use that information to do a range of different things. For example, an autoresponder can show you the percentage of subscribers who actually open your emails. If your email subject headings aren't successfully encouraging people to read, then you can identify this problem and work on a solution. Suddenly, we're using a data-driven approach in machine learning again. You can then see all the visitors who did read a given message in one place, or choose to see all the ones that didn't. You can see the open rate for different individual visitors, and you organize your list by different factors. That's another handy thing about using an autoresponder. It will allow you to grab more information using the form embedded on your page, and that information can then be used to group your visitors. Want to just message the men? Go for it. Want to just message the people over 30? You can do that too. Or how about having multiple different mailing lists for different brands, or even for different products? All of this can be accomplished using just a single autoresponder. And of course, this kind of control and automation opens up all sorts of possibilities when it comes to AI and machine learning for marketers. Lead warmth and email segmentation. The true power of all this information comes from being able to use that data in order to pick and choose who your messages go to. For instance, you can decide that you want to send an email only to people who fall into particular categories. What we're interested in to begin with is sending emails based on engagement, retention, and lead warmth. A lead is anyone who has shown some kind of interest in buying from you. That means that anyone who has signed up to your mailing list can be considered a lead because they have demonstrated an interest simply by doing this. But at the same time, a lead is also anyone who visits your site or who takes your card. This is a cold lead, whereas someone who actually gives you their contact details is a warm lead. Leads get warmer the more interest they show in what you do and what you're selling. And the warmer a lead is, the more likely they are to buy from you. In fact, this is the true and most useful purpose of having a mailing list to begin with and allows you to take your ice-cold leads and turn them into warm leads and then paying customers. I always liken this to asking for someone's phone number. If you were just to walk up to someone in a club and ask for their number, they'd likely just tell you to go away. Why would they give you their number when they know nothing about you and have shown no interest in you? First, you need to chat to them and let them get to know you. If they look at you and smile, they're a cold lead. If they respond to your witty banter and tell you their name, they're a warm lead. If they've kissed you or let you buy them a drink, they're a hot lead. And once they're hot, you can ask for their number. This is all about timing. Time this wrong, and they're not going to give you their number because you haven't laid the groundwork. The exact same thing is true with internet marketing. If someone visits your site and you tell them right away to buy your product, they won't. Why would they? You haven't given them any reason to trust you. You haven't told them anything about you. They don't know much about the product. Ask them to hand over their email after a few blog posts, though, and you can gently start to increase engagement. This is then when you wow them with all your information and all your knowledge. You entertain them a little, and you let them get to know you. If they don't open your emails, that's the equivalent of giving you the cold shoulder. That's like the girl or guy in the club that isn't laughing at your jokes and keeps looking away. If you try and sell to them now, you become spam and you get deleted. And they never return to your website. But if they open your emails, you know you're in with a shot. That means you can then send them some more information about your products and get them excited for your product launch. If during that they still keep opening your emails, then you know you've got an even better chance of success. If you now try and sell to them, there's a much better chance they'll buy from you. Using email segmentation, you can do exactly that. You can see which of your visitors are actually opening your emails, are actually clicking your links, and are scrolling down to the bottom. In fact, using cookies, it is even possible to see which of those visitors has been to your website and looked at your products. You can see who has hovered on your products and been tempted to click buy. Email segmentation combined with machine learning. If you have been paying close attention, then you might already have figured out where this is going. Remember when we discussed big data, we said that you could use predictive analytics in order to better rate leads? 
This is where things could get really interesting for the autoresponders of the future. Imagine if your autoresponder not only segmented your audience and looked at the open rates and engagement, but if it could look for trends across huge data sets. In other words, what if your autoresponder recorded every single person who bought from you and assessed what actions they usually took first? This would allow that machine learning algorithm to better spot when a user is behaving like someone ready to buy and to send them a message tailored to encourage that purchase. This could be combined with smart recommendations in order to improve their likelihood of buying even more. This is already being used by some big brands, so it's only a matter of time until more of us get access to this same amount of precision. Tips marketers can follow now. For any of that to work, you also need to make sure that people are signing up to your mailing list in the first place. Again. This will help us to prepare for the AI-powered future. There are a few ways you can encourage this. Firstly, make sure that you show your mailing list wherever you can. At the very least, that should mean that your mailing list is shown at the bottom of your post. At the same time, though, you can also place this in the sidebar so that your list is visible on every page of your site. Another tip is to make sure that you draw attention to it. A mistake a lot of people make is to create their mailing list and then just hope that people see it. Far more effective is to occasionally tell people about it and to explain in your post why it's a good opportunity and why people should be excited to sign up. Here's the thing, though. You should always be honest. The aim of a mailing list is not to grow it as much as you possibly can. Instead, the aim is to grow it as much as you can with only highly targeted visitors. If your visitors have no interest in what you're offering through your list, then you will just frustrate them and effectively be spamming advertising. At its core, machine learning is about evolving. It's about getting more and more data to the point that it can make more accurate assertions. While face detection and images might start out poor, the system evolves and learns to the point where it becomes more accurate than a human. Imagine if you could turn that power to advertising. Imagine if you could show precisely right advertisements to precisely the right people at precisely the right times. Imagine if your advertising campaign evolved to get more and more specific so that an increasingly large number of viewers clicked on the ads and bought your products. The longer the campaign ran, the more your profits would increase and the less you'd spend on ineffectual ads. That is precisely how programmatic advertising works, and you can start using it right now. What is programmatic advertising? Programmatic advertising campaigns allow marketers to buy native ads on a variety of publisher sites while using smart algorithms to ensure that they are targeting the right viewers at the right times, all while remaining within budget thanks to a bidding system that allows them to compete for impressions with other advertisers. In short, these campaigns give the precision and quality of native advertising, like banner ads, while at the same time allowing for the control, adaptability, and precision that you would get with a PPC campaign. The net result is ads appearing on the sites of carefully selected publishers, but only when and if they are likely to yield the best results. Programmatic advertising uses a complex algorithm in order to identify your business's ideal customer and then to figure out where they are likely to appear on the web. It will then show the ads in those places and then utilize a learning algorithm. Instead of going from one publisher to another discussing rates, you allow a bot to do all the work for you. More importantly, though, this means that you won't waste money on an ad slot that no one looks at. Your ads will be chosen and honed by a smart algorithm, and the result will be that they get higher CTRs from the right targeted customers. RTB this is how programmatic buying is different from other PPC or just buying a banner ad on your favorite news site. Giving you further control, meanwhile, is the option to use RTB or real-time bidding. What RTB essentially means is that you are automatically entering into a bidding war each time a page loads based on your predefined budget. These bidding wars allow your ads to compete with other advertisers around a large selection of different websites that all cater to the specific demographics and context that you have chosen. In other words, you will define that you want to target sports sites catering to an audience of males in their 20s to 40s, and from there, your ads will appear across a selection of those websites, which you can still curate in some cases if you wish, based on the outcome of each little bid. This allows you to target your audience across a range of different sites and to avoid paying too much to do so. On the other hand, direct buying is essentially a bulk order of impressions from a specific website or websites such as ESPN. You can still filter your impressions by a range of factors, such as location or browser, but essentially you will be targeting a specific site and securing a place on that precise spot. Direct buying is effectively a little more like advertising with a banner ad, 
While RTB is a little closer to the PPC model, here you bid for spots across a range of websites while still having a little more control. Deciding what will work best for you will depend on a number of factors. For instance, your budget is going to come into play as direct buying tends to be more expensive because lower CPIs won't have as many opportunities to appear. It's also worth considering that RTB gives you more flexibility, more data, and more control. You can identify which sites are working best for you, at which times, and for which viewers, and then you can further tailor your approach accordingly. On the other hand, though, if you bid too low using RTB, then you risk your ads not appearing at all. This is in direct contrast to direct buys, which essentially guarantee you your ad spot and that you will eventually be certain to get that number of impressions. This is useful for a company with more concrete goals and a fixed timescale. Likewise, with direct buying, you will be able to more tightly control where your advertising appears and forge a closer relationship between your brand and that of the publisher. So different approaches will work for different marketers and for different purposes. Your job is to decide which works best for you, and the best way to do that may be to dip your toe in and try them out for yourself. How to be more successful with programmatic buying. Programmatic advertising has very quickly risen to prominence in the online marketing industry and is an important new tool for any business that wants to reach a bigger audience. That said, though, even the best programmatic tools are only as effective as the people controlling them, so before you get ahead of yourself, consider these four crucial tips to ensure your success. Don't forget the creative component. No matter how well-targeted your ads are or how smart your campaign is in terms of exposure, if you haven't invested in the creative aspect, then those ads are going to fall flat. Design your ads well and test to see which designs work best. Likewise, think about your brand identity and how you can strengthen this even through ads that don't get clicked. Choose a programmatic partner who can help you with this aspect. Consider audience and context. Before choosing which publishers to work with, you need to look at the audience they are attracting as well as the context. The ideal partner will be a site that writes about topics related to yours and targets the precise same demographic you are. In some cases, though you won't be able to find both, and thus you will need to select publishers that provide the best balance. And don't be tempted to ignore context in these situations, because studies show that the same person is far more likely to click on an ad for golf clubs when they are on a golfing website compared with a new site. More to the point, someone who wants a wedding dress is only going to want that wedding dress during a particular time in their life, and this really demonstrates the importance of context. Be willing to spend to begin with. The beauty of programmatic advertising is that you can directly manage your spending in real time to ensure you get the maximum exposure whatever your budget. However, it is highly recommended that you start out with a higher spending limit than you intend to continue with, as this will enable you to more quickly identify what works and what doesn't. Remember, you want more data, and that means you want more clicks. As you tweak your campaign in response to stats and ROI, you will get closer and closer to the optimum setup. But if you don't spend the money up front, then you won't be able to tell if your campaign is working because you won't win enough bids. Spend a little up front and you'll save money in the long run once you settle into your groove. Make sure your ads fit in. The downside of any automated advertising campaign is that you can lose that personal touch. The benefits that come from working with a publisher to develop an advertising campaign that matches the tone and appearance of their overall site and that they will help to promote throughout their content. Unfortunately, native advertising is difficult to scale, which is why so many automatic platforms are popular. To be successful with programmatic advertising, this is something you need to consider. Your ad is targeting the right people, on the right devices in the right context. But is it the right fit for the job? This ad needs to look like a native ad in the same way that a banner ad would. Creating ads that will blend into a number of environments is one way to do this. Another is to choose a tool that allows you to select the brands you want to work with and then to choose those that are already closely aligned with your own goals and style. Big Data You might hear the term big data thrown around a lot and not fully understand what is meant by it. In this video, you will be enlightened and learn how big data can help you and your business both now and in the future. Essentially, big data is nothing more than large data sets. These large data sets are increasingly common online, seeing as everything online is easy to measure and document. If you think about a company like Google, it has immense data sets that it works from, describing the search history of billions of users. But even a standard website that gets 1,000 visitors a day will work with huge amounts of information. A website will naturally record each of those visits and will also store data about each one, such as the country of origin and the length of time spent on the site. 
In a few weeks, this data will likely crash a lot of spreadsheet software. The reason that big data is featured in so many discussions is that it is very difficult to handle. Making sense of such huge amounts of information requires a lot of smart math, while simply storing and handling that kind of data requires a lot of storage and computational power. But the potential value of big data is also absolutely huge. Big data provides patterns and insights that you simply can't get by observing a few users. This is essentially how machine learning works, by looking for patterns in massive data sets. The difference is that this is being leveraged in a slightly different way. Predictive modeling. Predictive modeling is a process that involves data mining and probability to forecast potential future outcomes. A model is created using a number of predictors. Predictors are variables that are thought to influence future results. Once data is collected for these predictors, a statistical model can be created. That might use a simple linear equation, or it might use complex neural networks. Either way, statistical analysis can then be used in order to make predictions about how things are likely to go in the future. With regards to marketing, this can help provide better customer insights, better lead scoring, campaign nurturing, upselling and cross-selling, personalized product recommendations, and more. Amazon is an example of a site that uses big data in order to provide personalized product recommendations. Amazon doesn't just use a database of items grouped together, which would be almost impossible to maintain, but rather generates data automatically from every single transaction and sale, and then looks for patterns. It will see what products tend to be bought together, there's that co-occurrence again, and can therefore use this information to show items that it thinks a user might want to buy next. Likewise, when it comes to lead scoring, big data can be immensely useful. Lead scoring means understanding which leads are likely ready to purchase and which are not. This is immensely useful information for companies that might want to send sales letters to the cross-section of their mailing list that they think will actually buy from them, rather than being put off by the amount of sales material they're receiving. Amnesty International uses segmentation and predictive modeling techniques in order to better identify the right groups to market toward. By collecting data and then looking at what that data reveals about the kinds of people who donate, Amnesty International knows who it should be targeting with its ads, how much they are likely to spend, and how they're likely to do it. Any charity can benefit from this kind of data analysis, as can any business. Collecting Big Data If you want to start collecting data for your business, there are a wide number of plugins and tools you can use to do so. You should find that a lot of tools, such as Google Analytics, will allow you to export massive amounts of data in order to work on. You can then choose to use this information yourself or outsource it to a data science organization that can use that information to provide valuable, useful insights. Another good idea to prepare yourself for the future is to allow users to create profiles. By doing this, you can collect much more data on individual users and in future provide better recommendations on an individual basis too. This is something that stores have been doing for decades with loyalty cards, but of course, the digital nature of selling online creates even more potential opportunities. Computer vision. As mentioned, computer vision is the ability for machines and computers to see by learning from huge data sets and machine learning. By observing countless images, a machine can learn to identify images in an object or to navigate an environment without crashing into things. What does this mean for the future of SEO? One big thing, and one thing that you should make sure that you are ready for, is that Google will likely start paying more attention to images on websites. Traditionally, we've been told to avoid using images for things like site names. Why? Because Google can't read an image, and therefore, we won't get any SEO benefit from that. But Google does have software that can read text from an image. This is called OCR, Optical Character Recognition. And if you want to see just how good it is, try pointing Google Translate at a foreign language and see it appear in your native tongue in real time. If Google can do this, then it's only a matter of time before it starts reading the text in your images to see if they back up the niche and key phrase that you are targeting with your website. Likewise, seeing as facial recognition is already a big deal when it comes to security and Facebook, it is probably only a matter of time before Google starts using that too. For example, if you write a blog post about Sylvester Stallone, Google might someday look not only at your content, but also at the photos on your page in order to see if there are pictures of Stallone there. Google Images might one day not be reliant on surrounding text at all, but might instead base its results purely on what it sees in the image and whether this lines up with what you're searching for. Issues like image quality are also likely to play a big role in the future.
Google might opt not to recommend your web page if it thinks the imagery on there is poorly chosen and out of place. So what can you do to prepare? For now, the closest thing to communicating with Google via images is the use of markup language and or file names and alt tags. Using alt tags to describe images can help Google to know what they represent and therefore to better decide if your site is relevant for a particular user. Meanwhile, make sure that all the imagery you are using is relevant and high quality. Preparing for semantic search. Whether Google Assistant eventually becomes the ubiquitous tool that Google wants it to be or not, the fact remains that Google wants search to become increasingly more natural and human. It already has in many ways. That means that marketers and website owners need to make some changes to the way they do things. It's no longer enough to find a keyword and repeat it a whole lot. You now need to work as though you're speaking with an AI. And that means a couple of things. LSI, Latent Semantic Indexing. Latent Semantic Indexing is one of the most important things to consider if you're interested in improving your SEO and getting to the top of Google. It's even more critical if you hope to be ready for Google's AI-driven future. Not only is it a powerful concept in itself, but it is also an important microcosm of the broader changes that we are seeing to SEO today. Search engine optimization is a big and very important part of digital marketing, and if you want to drive the maximum number of people to your website or blog, then it's absolutely essential that you have the search engines on board. In the past, SEO has largely relied on creating tons of content around a certain topic and repeatedly using a set number of keywords or key phrases in that content in order to help Google identify the subject and help the right visitors to find your pages. Unfortunately, a few people began to take advantage of this system and began keyword stuffing by using the same keywords over and over again to the point of distraction. Google had to get smarter, and so it did. Today, using the same keyword too much will get you into trouble. So what does Google do instead? It looks at context and the broader subject of the article. In other words, it looks for synonyms and related terms, and this also gives it the ability to better understand what your page is about. For instance, if you had written an article about decision trees, then in the past, Google could theoretically have gotten confused and brought your site up as a result when someone searched for trees. It may have thought you were talking about decisions about trees. Now, though, it can look for related terms like flowchart and thus help to more accurately match article to reader. LSI actually comes from mathematics and uses a technique called singular value decomposition. This means that it will scan unstructured data and look for the relationships between the words and concepts within. How to handle LSI. So, how do you make sure your site is LSI optimized? Short answer, you don't. While it is obviously tempting for SEO companies to now start offering their LSI optimized services, the truth is that you should have been doing this all along and without thinking about it. That's what the best web marketers like Andre Illison have always recommended, and it's what Matt Cutts advises as well. In short, writing naturally should mean that you are including synonyms and related topics. Otherwise, your writing is going to sound pretty repetitive. The moral is what it's always been. Stop double-guessing and just write for the reader. This is something we'll come back to again and again with regards to preparing for a smarter Google. But there are also some other tips you can keep in mind if you want to ensure that Google knows what you're talking about. First, make sure that you use more than one search phrase. It's a good idea for a whole host of reasons to use a combination of different search terms rather than targeting just a single one. Seeing as Google will often show results that don't use the exact key phrase the person searched for, it makes sense to try and include a few popular iterations of the same term. Likewise, you should make sure to use good and varied vocabulary around the topic. This helps to better demonstrate the context and the subject matter of your article. Rather than filling an article with random synonyms, Think instead about words that would often occur alongside the topic you're working with, such as our earlier example of flowcharts. This is called co-occurrence, and it's the kind of thing that machine learning algorithms love. Structured data. The other big concept that SEOs need to consider in order to be ready for the AI Google of the future is schema markups, also known as structured data, also known as rich data. Remember, Google's aim is to enable Assistant to answer natural language questions with useful responses, which will draw on information found on the web. Google doesn't just want to pull up a list of useful search results. It wants to be able to answer questions. So if someone asks how to make bolognese, it will simply read out the ingredients. In order to do this, Google needs to be able to find that most relevant information in a passage of text and then pull out the specific answer. 
This takes the concept of rank brain to the next level, allowing it to understand not just what an article is about, but how each paragraph in that article functions. The problem is that Google's AI can't quite do this yet, at least not well enough to be able to usefully provide answers for people without occasionally including complete nonsense. That's where schema markups come in. The idea of a schema markup is to essentially annotate your articles and blog posts by telling Google what each bit is and what it does. Essentially, you're saying this is a list of ingredients or this is a user rating. This also helps Google to provide what are known as rich snippets. Rich snippets are search results on the SERPs, search engine result pages, that include more than just a meta description. You might see a search result listed, for instance, that also includes bullet point steps or that includes ingredients for the meal. This way, the user can see the information they're looking for without even needing to leave that website. How to use markups. Markups look a lot like HTML. Here's an example of what this might look like. That is basically telling Google that you were talking about a local business, the Candle Factory. You can also use Schema to highlight product names, authors, aggregate ratings, software applications, restaurants, movies, and much more. To use this information, you can either look up the HTML code and implement it yourself, or you can use Google's handy markup helper, https colon forward slash forward slash www.google.com forward slash webmasters forward slash markup hyphen helper forward slash u forward slash zero. Here you will simply share the URL of the page you want to mark up, and it will then provide you with the opportunity to create the necessary tags. There are also plugins you can use to the same end through WordPress. The good and the bad of schema markups. The savvy among you may have noticed some worrying issues with schema markups. Specifically, they encourage people not to visit your website. Let's say you have a recipes website and you included an article on cooking bolognese. You probably did this hoping that people would search for it on Google, find your website, and then visit your page in order to read about it. In doing so, they might also click on a few ads, they might buy an affiliate product, or they might just remember your brand so they come back again in the future. But if Google simply takes your key information and shares it, then there is no real incentive for them to actually visit your web page. As such, there's no chance that they will click on your ads or buy your products. They'll not even know that the information came from your website. Essentially, Google is this way using our intellectual property without any remuneration, which has upset a lot of webmasters, businesses, and marketers. So should you avoid using these features altogether? Unfortunately, that is not really an option. Remember, Google also uses markups in order to provide rich snippets. These are the more media-rich search listings, which include things like star ratings, images, bullet points, and more. These really help a web page to stand out in the SRPs and thereby ensure that more people click on that listing. And while you might not get any benefit from having Google read your ingredients out, if you don't include markup language, then it will just get that same information from one of your competitors. Google wants to use schema markups, and that means that it will likely reward those sites that do with a little SEO boost. For all those reasons, it's essential that you keep using this strategy, even though you might be giving Google free information in doing so. In the future, if more and more people talk to their Google Assistant rather than browsing the web for information, then there's a good chance Google might need to rethink its policy, lest it face a rather big backlash from content creators. How to future-proof your marketing. Over the course of this training, we've examined a large number of different types of AI and machine learning in the context of digital marketing. The objective of all this has been to help you better prepare for the future. You know that you should start collecting as much data as possible right now, that you need to add schema markups to your site, that you should be using LSI, that you could benefit from a chatbot. You even know a little bit about SQL, just in case you ever decide to get involved behind the scenes. But in all likelihood, all of this is going to change a lot more before it enters the scene, and we can't really anticipate just how its impact will be felt. There are huge waves making their way through internet marketing, and the power of AI can't really be understated. Imagine, for instance, what will happen once AI that can write high-quality content becomes commonplace and commercially available. This technology already exists, AI that can write nearly as well as a human. But when it is allowed to cut loose on the web, it could potentially flood the Internet with new enough content to double or triple its size in a matter of days. How will we know what's written by a human and what's not? What about when AI can create realistic-looking images? We've already seen the power of deep fakes. How will we know what's real and what's not? We can't really prepare for these scenarios because we don't know how they will play out. 
So for now, it is best to focus on what we do know. And in particular, as a marketer, that means focusing on Google's move to natural language processing and more human-like interactions. It also means that Google is going to keep getting smarter. Google used to look for keyword matches, but now it actually understands the meaning of a website and can use many more metrics in order to understand whether it is high or low quality and whether it is delivering on what it claims to do. In fact, Google likely has the potential to become the most powerful AI on the planet owing to the huge amount of information it has access to and the huge resources that the company pour into it. This makes it increasingly difficult to game the system or to try and trick Google. The best thing we can do then, make the best quality content we can. As Google becomes more and more human, writing for Google and writing for the reader will mean essentially the same thing. It's time we started focusing on great quality content and on providing real value. The key thing to remember is that Google serves its customers first and foremost. Who are its customers? The users who use it to find information and entertainment. Google wants people to keep using its search, and as such, it needs to make sure it consistently brings up only the most relevant and interesting information. As long as you are concerned with creating great quality content for your readers, then your goals and Google's will be aligned. Thus, each time it gets a little bit smarter, that will work to your favor instead of being something you need to worry about. As Google gets smarter, it will find more ways of identifying the best quality content. And so, if you're focused on delivering that, Google will find more ways of connecting you with your audience. Combine this with more data collection and a generally more data-driven approach to marketing, and you'll be ready for the future of the industry. Google as an AI-first company. A while ago now, Google announced that it had become an AI-first company. While that may sound like meaningless marketing babble, the truth is that this determination actually has huge potential repercussions for marketers, businesses, and SEO. Firstly, what does Google mean by this? Meet the new, smarter Google. You might think of Google as a search-first company. The first product that Google provided was a search engine, and that is still what most of us associate with the company. Traditionally, Google's search engine did not work much like an AI. Rather, search worked by attempting to match search terms with the content in an article. This is why the advice for SEOs was to insert lots of key phrases into their articles so that Google spiders could read that content and quickly identify that it would be a good match for what the person was searching for. As we all know, this didn't work out perfectly for Google. Lots of unscrupulous marketers abused the system by inserting hundreds of search terms into every article, which in turn meant that content Google would show to the user would be garbled and unreadable. That's why, over time, Google has begun to work more and more like an AI. Now, Google no longer attempts to look for exact keyword matches. Instead, Google tries to answer questions that you ask it. It does this by trying to understand what the user is looking for along with the context and then to provide relevant answers through its search. Rank Brain Google is able to do this through machine learning. Specifically, it uses a form of natural language processing, which Google refers to as Rank Brain. RankBrain is at least partly responsible for helping Google to cope with phrases and words that it hasn't seen before. If RankBrain identifies a word it isn't familiar with, then it can guess what it might mean based on context and based on its usage elsewhere. This helps Google to deal with unusual searches that it hasn't seen before without simply matching search terms to content in articles. Search queries are turned into word vectors called distributed representation. These are words and phrases that are close to each other in meaning and context. RankBrain will then try to map the query into words it understands or clusters of similar words. From there, it insinuates what the searcher actually means and is looking for and provides results on that basis. RankBrain also understands the relationships between words and the way that they work together. At one point, joining words such as the or and were ignored by Google. Now, Google understands the importance of these phrases and the way in which they impact on the intent of the user. Like all the best machine learning algorithms, RankBrain attempts to improve over time and adapt to users. It can see which results get clicked the most and thereby know when it is doing well and when it is getting things wrong. As such, it is able to improve search results for any given keyword quickly through algorithmic testing, which is helping to weed out low-quality content that attempts to game the system. RankBrain works using a Tensor Processing Unit, TPU, which is an AI-specific piece of hardware stored in Google's data centers. This is a specific chip that is better able to handle the specific challenges of machine learning tasks.
Google's further plans. Over the past few years, Google may have seemingly diversified. It now makes smartphones, it now makes self-driving cars, and it now makes apps like Google Lens. But at the heart of all these initiatives is some form of AI or machine learning. Google Lens uses machine learning to identify objects in a scene and allow users to that way search the real world around them. Self-driving cars, of course, are highly reliant of various forms of AI. And the Google Pixel phones? Arguably, their main focus is putting Google Assistant in everyone's pockets. And this is the real clue as to what Google is up to. Google Assistant is an AI and virtual assistant that users can use to get weather reports, to book taxis, to play music, and much more. Google Assistant uses a combination of machine learning to detect human language, for example, and AI in order to provide useful results and speak in a natural manner. Google Assistant is closely integrated with Google Search. You can ask Google Assistant a question like, who started Iron Man? And it will give you a natural answer. It does this by first using machine learning to turn your speech into a string, then by using Google Search in order to look up useful answers, which involves machine learning in the form of rank brain. Then by using narrow AI to extract the most useful answers from the best web pages, and then by using another form of narrow AI to provide the response in a natural sounding manner, which is designed to appear like general AI. Much of this is carried out not on the device that you're speaking to, but on Google's TPU located in the cloud. What does all this mean for marketers? So what does all this mean for marketers? Simple. It means that Google wants to be able to understand your content and extract the most useful information. It no longer wants you to use rigid keywords, and it wants you to prepare for a more voice-driven form of search. Google is betting big on AI and machine learning. It believes that in the future, AI assistance will be huge, and it wants Google Assistant to be number one. It envisages a future where we spend less time staring at our devices and instead get the information we need by asking our phones or our Google Homes. We'll speak naturally to these devices, and they'll provide us with handy answers. What is AI and machine learning? Before we go further, we should first take a look at precisely what AI and machine learning actually are. These are two related but also distinct terms, which often get confused. Both will impact on marketing, but in different and unique ways. AI, then, is artificial intelligence. That means software and hardware designed to act and appear intelligent. Such software is capable of making meaningful choices and conducting activities that we would normally consider the domain of humans. AI comes in two broad flavors. One is weak AI, which is also known as narrow AI. Weak AI is essentially a form of AI that is designed to perform a specific job. An example of this is the self-driving car. This form of AI is capable of knowing the positions of countless cars on the road and being able to respond by steering, accelerating, braking, etc. If you were to watch a self-driving car from the outside, you might think a human were driving. In that way, it does a job that would normally be considered a human role. But, at the same time, you can't speak with a self-driving car and you can't ask it how it's feeling. A self-driving car would certainly not pass the Turing test. Note, the Turing test is a test designed to measure the effectiveness of an AI. If you talk to an AI on a chat app and you don't know that it isn't human, then it is considered to have passed the Turing test. Another example of weak AI is used when creating bad guys in computer games. These use programming in order to behave in a human-like manner and to provide a challenge for the player. However, the code is only useful in the context of the video game, and so it's not about to turn into Skynet anytime soon. Weak AI might not sound as exciting, but it is being used for a huge range of extremely exciting things, from helping to treat disease to improving the economy. Conversely, the type of AI that we often see in science fiction is what we know as general AI. This is AI that doesn't just have one purpose, but that is designed to do everything that a human might be able to do. So, you could play a word game with this AI, ask it how it's feeling, or get it to look up something useful. An example of a general AI is DeepMind, owned by Google. DeepMind is a company that has developed a neural network that employs general learning algorithms to learn a huge range of different skills. Many AIs, such as IBM's Watson, are actually pre-programmed. That means that they work using a kind of flowchart and will answer questions with the same answer every time. On the other hand, DeepMind is apparently able to think and respond via a convolutional neural network. Certain behaviors are reinforced and encouraged, and these will begin to become more prominent. This isn't a perfect simulation of how a human brain works. 
Cognitive behavioral psychology teaches us the importance of having internal dialogues and models for thinking. However, it is the closest thing we currently have to a true general intelligence. Machine learning. Machine learning, on the other hand, works differently. Machine learning utilizes huge data sets in order to gain surprising and almost frightening capabilities at times. Machine learning essentially allows a piece of software to be trained. An obvious example of this would be computer vision. Computer vision describes the ability that some machines have to understand visual information. An example is Google Lens, which can tell you what you're pointing your phone's camera at, whether that's a type of flower or a product you can buy in stores. Computer vision is necessary for self-driving cars to successfully navigate their environments and is used by apps like Snapchat, which use filters to change people's faces. How do these work? By looking at thousands and thousands of pictures of every type of object. While the machine learning algorithm will never understand what it is looking at, it can look for patterns in the data which will then be used to identify those objects in the future. For example, it might notice that faces are typically oval in shape with a dark patch of hair on top. It then knows that if it sees an oval shape with a dark patch at the top, it's possibly looking at a face. Machine learning has huge potential in just about every field. In the future, it can be used to diagnose diseases more accurately than a human doctor to advise on financial decisions, to identify fraudulent bank transfers, and much more. All of this has huge potential implications for internet marketing, and that's what we'll be exploring in the following videos. Introduction. Being smart in business means knowing what's just around the corner. It means thinking ahead and preparing for inevitable changes that will impact the way business is conducted. This is what allows a business to be resilient and to thrive in a changing environment. Digital marketing is no different. In fact, in his book, The Personal MBA, author Josh Kaufman discusses the value of counterfactual simulation. This means imagining future possibilities and then preparing for them. Let's say that you have a big business that is doing well in a specific niche. Maybe you have a company that sells a whey protein shake. The mistake that some big businesses make is to assume that they're too big to fail and to coast along as they are. But what would happen if another company came along and released a better protein shake for a fraction of the price? What if a new source of protein were to be discovered? What if a study revealed that whey protein was bad for us? Any of these things could happen and could completely shake up even the most established business. The smart company, though, will already have considered these eventualities and prepared for them. This is counterfactual simulation. It's thinking about what's just around the corner and then preparing for those possibilities. As digital marketers, that means thinking about things that could impact on the face of marketing. And one of the things that could have the biggest impact of all? Artificial intelligence. AI and machine learning have the potential to completely change the face of internet marketing, rendering many older strategies obsolete even. Only by preparing for those changes can you ensure that your websites manage to hold their position in the SERPs, that your advertising campaigns remain profitable, and that your services remain relevant. And a lot of this stuff isn't just speculation. It's happening right now. AI is already making huge waves, even though you may not realize it yet. It's affecting the way that SEO works, the tools and software we use, and the way that ads are displayed. AI is able to think faster and smarter than any human. And that's especially true when it comes to internet marketing, which is a data-driven pursuit. An AI marketer can create endless amounts of content in a second, doing the work of hundreds of humans. All of that content will be perfectly catered toward the target demographic. AI will run Google. It will manage entire business models. It will run AdWords. And it will run new tools we haven't even dreamed up yet. The digital marketing singularity is just around the corner. This training will help you to prepare and explain several concepts. AI versus machine learning. How to conduct SEO now that Google is an AI-first company. Chatbots. Programmatic advertising big data, rank brain, digital assistance, data science, SQL, latent semantic indexing, and the future of internet marketing. In this training, you will gain a crystal ball with which to gaze into the future of internet marketing and to ensure that you are ready for all those changes when they come. By the end, you'll be better prepared and in a better position than 99.9% .9 of other marketers. Wait! Before you get started, how would you like to get bigger ROIs and start making money with Bing Ads even faster? 
First off, I want to personally thank you for purchasing the step-by-step -step guide to Bing Ads. You'll have profitable campaigns running in no time with what you'll discover inside the guide. But what if you could take a shortcut to success with PPC using Bing Ads? What if you could begin getting positive ROIs faster? And what if you could also get better results and make sure that you avoid the most common pitfalls people run into with Bing Ads? Although the guide you just purchased is written in a step-by-step -step format, many people learn much better by watching something done as opposed to just reading about it in a guide. That's because most people are visual learners. How about you? How do you normally learn the best? Would you rather read through a training course or would it be easier to get results if you could watch a video training that shows you exactly how to do it? If you're like most people, watching a video is far more effective than going through a text-based course alone. In fact, most people that get a text-based guide rarely get all the way through the training. And of the few people that do complete the training, very few actually retain what they read about. That means even if you finish the guide, you may not actually use what you just read about. That's a waste of your time and your money. But what if you didn't have to choose? What if you could get a complete video training course in addition to the text-based training guide that you just purchased? Something that will take you by the hand and give you that next level of training that you need to get big results with Bing Ads. That means more traffic, more conversions and bigger profits in your pocket. The good news is you're going to get the one-time opportunity to get your hands on a video upgrade to the course you just purchased today. At a big discount. I want you to start getting targeted traffic that converts like crazy as quickly as possible. That's why I put together this powerful video upgrade to the guide you just purchased. You see, there are little details that can be the difference in seeing huge results with Bing Ads and ultimately falling flat on your face and not making a dime in profit. Or even worse. If you do things wrong with Bing Ads, you could even find yourself losing money. I don't want that to happen. This video upgrade makes absolutely sure you don't miss any important details when it comes to getting started with Bing Ads, setting up your first campaign, learning how to handle targeting and create your ads for the best results, and ultimately knowing when to scale your campaign up and maximize your profits. If you miss even one step in the process of getting set up with your first campaign and running your ads, you could find yourself wasting a ton of time and ultimately missing out on sales or even losing money on ads that don't convert. When you follow what you'll learn inside the step-by-step -step video training, you'll ensure that you get success with Bing ads right out of the gates. Click the button below to get instant access. And of course, as an existing customer, you'll get access to the upgrade with special, customer-only discounted pricing. This is the next best thing to having a Bing Ads expert taking you by the hand and showing you how to get big results with Bing. Because this is so powerful, it will be easy to charge $500 or more for this upgrade. And it will be worth every penny. But you won't pay anywhere near $500 today when you make the smart decision to upgrade. 
And to make it even easier to get started with this upgrade today, you're also going to get an exclusive bonus of 10 high-quality audio MP3s of all the training. This makes it easy to learn on the go and get results even faster. When you add the MP3s to the 10 high-quality videos that show you how to see success with Bing Ads, it's impossible to fail. And to make upgrading a complete no-brainer, you get to test drive this upgrade for the next 30 days with absolutely zero risk. If for any reason, or no reason at all, you're not 100% satisfied with what you learn inside, simply send me an email and I'll refund every single penny of your tiny investment. No questions asked. But please don't wait. This is an exclusive one-time offer at pricing that's only available to my existing customers. If you wait, you may never get another chance to get access to this at a price this low. Click the button below to get instant access today. At the most basic level, Bing ads work like Google AdWords. So if you're familiar with the concept of PPC in general, you can probably fast forward some of this video. Still here? Then let's quickly recap. Essentially, PPC ads are pay-per-click ads. That means you'll literally be paying per click, paying for each person who clicks on one of your adverts. The reason this is such good news is that you'll never pay anything for a campaign that was a complete failure. If you create an advertising campaign for Bing and not one person looks at it, then it will literally cost you nothing. It also means you can precisely calculate the cost of each visitor to your site. Now, this is important because you can use that information to calculate how much each customer is worth and thereby start making very accurate projections about your earnings and identifying the best ways to spend your money. So the next logical question is how much you're going to spend on each click. And the good news is that you get to choose this. You get to choose your maximum spend and you also get to choose your budget for the day. First, you define your CPC or cost per click, which is going to be the maximum amount of money that you're willing to spend for each new visitor. You'll probably want to keep this fairly low. The most that brands will generally tend to spend is up to $2, but even that's unusual. Generally, though, you'll want to set this a bit lower and your average will probably come in at around 10 to 20 cents. The next thing to do is to set your daily budget. Once the accumulated clicks you've received reach this amount, they'll stop and you won't spend any more money. So in theory, if you set your CPC to 20 cents and you set your daily spend to $20, that should mean you get 100 visits to your site for that amount. But things get a little more complicated seeing as you don't tend to spend the full amount of your CPC. That's because there's a bidding system that takes place which means you'll often spend a lot less. Now the way this works is quite simple. If there are two or more adverts both competing for the same space on Bing, then they will enter into a bidding war. The ad with the highest CPC will be the one that wins and gets shown, but the owner of that ad will only be charged the minimum amount that it needed to win. The easiest way to understand this is to just think of it a bit like eBay. You know, on eBay you can set your maximum bid, but you'll only end up paying $1 more than the next highest bidder. And the same is true with most PPC campaigns, and that's why you'll end up spending 33.5% less on Bing versus Google, because the lower amount of competition means that your CPC won't be as likely to get driven up. And of course, you also need to consider that your ads will be shown to a lot of people who don't click. You don't pay anything for these ads, but that doesn't mean they're worthless to you because you'll still be getting exposure and you'll still be starting to build your brand. The other thing that most PPC ad networks have in common is the ability to target a specific demographic. 
And this means that you can identify who your buyer persona is and profile your ideal customer from there. Then you can target that person specifically with your adverts. The way you do this with both Bing Ads and Google AdWords is by targeting search terms. When you pay for these ads, you're literally putting your adverts on the SERPs relating to a particular search term. You do this by choosing a keyword or key phrase, which is going to be the thing that you want people to search for in order to find your site. So, for example, if you were selling a hat, your key phrase would probably be buy hat online or cheap hats, etc. This is now a targeted ad because it lets you advertise specifically to people who are looking to buy the thing you have. That means they'll fit within your target audience and actually this makes them qualified leads. Another way this might work is by going the slightly long-term route and focusing on search terms related to interest. You might have a site where you blog about fitness, for example, and sell supplements and training clothing. In this case, your keyword might be how to lose weight or fitness articles. A good keyword is going to be one that is both popular with your specific target audience and that is not overly competitive. We'll look at this in more detail in the subsequent videos. Rounding out the holy trinity of PPC networks is Facebook ads. Facebook ads are similar to Google AdWords or Bing ads in terms of being PPC, but the difference is in where the ads are shown and how they're targeted. As you might have guessed, Facebook ads are shown on Facebook and will appear in the home feed and sidebars while you're browsing. These show ads which are once again tailored to the person using Facebook. But this differs in so far as the ads are targeted based on information the user has given Facebook. Information such as their age, their sex, their marital status, their location and even their hobbies and interests. This allows you to even more precisely target the right person, but not necessarily at the right time when they're looking for products. When someone is browsing Facebook to catch up with their friends, they're more likely to be just frustrated to see your adverts popping up. With all this in mind, Facebook ads is another useful platform to add to your campaign in conjunction with Bing and Google AdWords. Just make sure you're using the right ads for the right location. As you can see, PPC works a little bit differently from traditional advertising in magazines and on TV. You're no longer paying for a single advert, nor are you paying for exposure. Instead, you're paying directly for clicks, and that means you need to think about things a little differently. The first concept to make sure you understand is that your aim is not necessary to get as many clicks as possible. Traditional advertising campaigns will often focus on doing anything they can to get attention and to encourage clicks. But seeing as you're going to have to pay for each click, you can actually reduce the amount you're paying in total by reducing the amount of clicks you get. The objective is not to get as many people as possible to your website. Your objective is to get as many customers as possible to your website. In other words, you need to get traffic that's going to convert and you actually want to dissuade all other people from clicking on your ads wherever possible. If you pay for 100 clicks and 99 of those pay for your product, then you can consider that a highly effective marketing campaign. Conversely, if you pay for 2,000 clicks and only 300 of those people buy, it's actually not been as successful because you will have spent more. What this essentially tells us is that the bottom line is by far the best way to gauge your success. A good PPC campaign is not one that gets seen a lot, nor one that gets clicked a lot. A good PPC campaign is one that earns a lot. This means it's impossible to separate your PPC strategy from your general business model, and it makes it very important to think about your budget, your costs and your profit margins whenever you set up a campaign. So start by thinking about the profits for whatever it is you're selling from your site. If you're selling lots of products, this might mean working out an average profit you make from those products. 
Otherwise, if you're linking to a sales page and predominantly saying just one product, then it will mean thinking about how much you make from that one item. First, that means calculating your COGS, that is, cost of goods sold. And it tells you how much it costs you to make each of your products. Now, let's say that you sell phone cases. This will mean paying for the materials, the manufacturing, the delivery and the storage. Then you have to subtract these overheads from the amount you charge for each item. What you're left with is your profit margin. The great thing about digital products like ebooks or online courses, which is what a lot of website owners sell, is that you have zero overheads and that means you'll be making 100% profit on each sale. An ebook that you sell for $30 will give you a $30 profit. That said, ebooks appeal to a smaller audience when compared with physical items and thereby you can expect to have a smaller conversion rate which is the next point. So here you need to calculate how many visitors on average buy your products from you. This means looking at your conversion rate. If you have 1,000 visitors a day and one sale, then that means you have a 0.1% conversion rate. If you make 10 sales for every 1,000, then that means you now have a 1% conversion rate. This can tell you how much you're earning in a day. For example, if you have 1,000 visitors a day, a 0.1% conversion rate, and a product that earns you $20, then you will earn $20. That also means you can work out how much you are going to be able to earn if you increase your visitors. If you could double your visitors, then you should make $40 on average. If you can multiply them by 10, then you should make $200 on average. More importantly for your Bing ads though, this also tells you how much each visitor is worth to you. If 1,000 visitors equals $30, then that means each visitor is worth 3 cents. 3 cents isn't a lot of money and that's why it's so important that you think about this before you create an advertising campaign. Because if you were to go ahead with these numbers and start paying $1 per click, you'd end up losing a lot of money. Working out your numbers first is what will allow you to ensure you're making a good profit. But what you might find is that you need to tweak some things before you get started. For instance, you can increase the asking price of your product and thereby increase your profits to $0.05 cents or $0.10. Cents. Better yet, you should focus on improving your conversion rates by improving the quality or desirability of your product and by improving your persuasive writing so that people who land on your site will be overcome with the powerful desire to buy your products. If you can do this, then maybe you'll be able to increase your conversion rate to 5%, thereby increasing the value of each customer by five times that amount. Now comes the good part. If you set your CPC to this number, you know, the amount that each visitor is worth to you, then you literally cannot fail. Your clicks will now result in profits, and the more you raise your budget, the more profit you'll make. You're spending less per click than each visitor is worth to you. Except that isn't quite how this is going to work. Because actually, here comes the good part, it's going to work better than that. That's because the people currently on your website are all people who got there through, well, all kinds of different means. These are people who found you on social media, who typed your address in by accident, who found you on Google, or who were recommended by a friend. And that means they're going to be variably targeted. Some of those people will have zero interest in your products. And that's why it's so important you think about targeting the right kind of user in your adverts. And that's also why we're not trying to simply get as many visitors as possible. As mentioned, it's actually more important that we get lots of the right users and put off people who aren't likely to want to buy. Your objective then is to make sure that the way you design your ads is only going to appeal to potential customers. That means your text shouldn't read, click here for the amazing secret to losing weight. Rather, it should read, click here for a $30 ebook that will make you lose weight fast. Or, 
The Secret to Weight Loss, just $30. What this does is prevent anyone not looking to spend money from clicking on your ad. We don't want these people because they're costing us money. But someone who knows the price up front and is still willing to click is very likely to want your book. Assuming you can convince them that your product is what they're looking for and it's good value for money, you should be able to walk away with a sale. Now, think about how much higher conversion rates will be for people who click this ad versus people who just stumbled onto your site. You can further target your customers by placing your adverts on the right keywords and key phrases. This is a big part of the PPC campaigns, and it's very much worth doing your research here. Again, you need to make sure your keywords are things that the right people are going to be searching for. At the same time, though, you also need to keep your competition low so that the average CPC will be as low as possible. If you try and rank for, say, hotels, then you're going to be up against thousands of other businesses, some of which will have near infinite resources. You know, how do you like the sound of competing with Expedia, Airbnb, or Hotels.com and the rest? They can afford to offer $1, $2, or $5 per click, and you just won't be able to keep up. But use a keyword that is popular but not overpopulated, like Quirky Hotel Santa Monica or Romantic Getaway in Bournemouth, and you're going to be paying less and targeting a more specific type of customer meaning you can use a more specific and tailored landing page for them focused on the area and type of experience. How do you find a keyword that's popular, directly targeted, but not overcrowded? Simple. You use Bing's own keyword tool, which can be found here at bing.com forward slash toolbox forward slash keywords. And then you just simply sign in uh, with your, uh, your Bing account or with your Microsoft account. And this tool will let you search different keywords and will then show you the amount of people searching for that term in the date range you specify. You can look at how many times a term has appeared in the search over the last six months, for example. If something came up 50,000 times, then that's a fairly good keyword that will potentially be able to grab you up to 50,000 visitors. But if the search term came up 100 times, then it's a lot less useful to you. Note that Google also has a keyword tool called its Keyword Planner, and you can use this in just the same way as you would use Bing's own keyword tool, and it doesn't really matter if it's from Google. People tend to search for the same things on both engines. And if you just do a search in Google for Google AdWords Keyword Planner, it'll direct you to the local version of the site. Finally, another tip is to look at your site's metrics and identify who is currently coming to your website. If you have Google Analytics set up correctly, then you'll be able to find out which visitors are buying from you and what they typed in in order to get there. In other words, it might be that certain search terms result in more sales or goals in Google parlance, and you can then decide to target that keyword with your Google and Bing ads. Finally, another mitigating factor is the small matter of CLV. Customer lifetime value refers to the fact that just because a visitor doesn't put down their cash right away, it doesn't mean they aren't worth anything to you. In fact, if they sign up for your mailing list and then become lifelong fans, they could ultimately end up being worth more to you. For this reason, the only way to really be sure if your Bing ads are working for you is to watch your metrics very closely. This means looking at how many visitors you're getting, where they're coming from, and how your sales increase as you spend. The more data you track, the more profitable any PPC campaign will be. When all is said and done, the best way to learn how to make the most of Bing is simply to learn on the job. Watch your metrics over time and tweak your approach accordingly. However, all the information in this video series will ensure that you're in the best position to start an effective PPC campaign generally and an effective Bing campaign specifically. The key is to look at the end result and your ROI as opposed to just trying to get the maximum number of clicks possible. 
At the same time, you need to think about setting up goals and being as precise as you can with your keywords and descriptions. The other big tip, invest in Bing. Bing might not be as big as Google, but that's actually an advantage. You'll pay less and get seen more, meaning that you can bring many more visitors to your site without directly competing with the biggest players in your niche. At the same time, this way, you can give yourself a boost and start to grow your audience even with less of a budget in the bank. Then you can benefit from the surprisingly impressive unique features of Bing, including more advanced targeting, tracking and more. And if there ever is a Google apocalypse, well, you'll be laughing. So now you know precisely what Bing ads are, why they matter and how they work. You also know how to create a PPC campaign generally and you know how to select the right keywords, etc. What's left? Oh yeah, actually getting started and creating some ad campaigns. And with that in mind, let's launch straight into setting up some campaigns and doing a tour around Bing's options and tools. Before we get started, I'm going to assume that you A, have set up a Bing Ads account and you can do that by going to secure.bingads.microsoft.com and then it will redirect you to this page. And then you can sign up using your existing Microsoft account or you can set up a new one, whichever is most convenient for you. And the second assumption, assumption B, is that you've chosen your keywords using the advice in the previous video. Here's the good news. If you already have a Google AdWords campaign set up, then getting that campaign to work on Bing is very simple. First, head on over to the link on the far right that reads Import Campaigns right here at the top of the toolbar. Click on it and then click here where it says import from Google AdWords. Now click here on sign in to Google, enter your name and password. On the next page, you'll be given the opportunity to select the AdWords campaigns that you want to import. Choose them and then click continue. Now under Bing Ads account and import options, you'll just need to add a few more settings that are unique to Bing. That means choosing the Bing Ads account you want to import to, choosing the right time zone, and remember that Bing allows more flexibility in this department, choosing the appropriate options under what to import, choosing the options you want for your bids and budget, and now just click import and you're done. Remember we said earlier that the best way to handle Bing Ads was to use them on top of a Google AdWords campaign? Well, this is why it makes a lot of sense to simply import an existing AdWords campaign into your Bing account. Yep, it couldn't be simpler. But if you don't have a Google AdWords campaign or you want to try something different on Bing, and this is a good place to experiment with different strategies, then you want to click Campaigns and then Create a Campaign. And you can choose between a search campaign or a shopping campaign. Search campaigns show just regular search ads and shopping campaigns will show you products with images in your search ads. So let's uh, have a search campaign. Let's click on that one. Now you'll be asked to give your campaign a name. Uh, automatically it gives it the campaign and then number. I'm going to leave it at the default setting for this particular demonstration. Then you set your time zone and uh, having the time zone is very important in Bing ads. Then you set your campaign budget and your bid strategy. Then the language. Then the locations that you want to target or exclude. And you can have all available countries or regions. Uh, because I'm in the UK, it's saying Ireland, United Kingdom, United Kingdom or selected states, provinces, countries, regions and postal codes. And then the advanced location options. And this is very, very handy indeed. You can show ads to people in searching for showing interest in your targeted location, people in your targeted location, 
or people searching for or showing interest in your targeted location. So, for example, you know, you might have someone who's um, looking for a hotel or an amenity in an area that they intend to visit. So you can target them and not people in your local market. So it gives you a lot of flexibility there. Scroll down a bit more and you come here to create an ad. Now you want to create an ad. And first of all, you decide on your ad type and your ad title. Now, the ad title is the headline. And as you remember, we discussed earlier, the headline is not designed to get the maximum number of clicks, but rather to get the right kind of clicks. Then you want to have your ad text, which is just going to you know, give your ad a bit more detail. And underneath, you're going to put your display URL. Now, if your destination is a very long URL, then you can simply use this uh, as um, a permalink, or you can use uh, the root location, or you can use the actual URL. It, it's up to you. You also want to set the landing page. It can be the final URL, or it can be a destination URL, and you can put all the information in here. You know, for example, you want um, a mobile URL, etc. And all the way along, there are these little um, learn more question mark bubbles. If you click on those, it gives you a lot of information about how the whole site works. Headlines are 25 characters. Ad text is 71 characters. Further down the page is where you'll be given the option to choose your keywords set keyword bids and then verify activation. Meaning you set the method of payment and also you'll click that you want the ads to go live. Now refer to the last video for more on selecting the right keywords. You'll be able to choose a bid for each keyword. So you might decide that some keywords are worth more to you than others. And this is very good news because it means you can pay very little for those more obscure keywords that would only get you a few clicks, but that likely wouldn't be very expensive due to a lack of competition. The more good news is that you can tweak and manage your campaign after it's gone live. This means you can see how it's performing and then see how they're working for you. You'll be able to find some more advanced settings here too, such as negative keywords and dynamic keywords. We'll look at these options in more detail in the next video. For now though, we want to focus on the other most important aspect of running your Bing Ads campaigns, which is tracking the success of your adverts. In this case, that's going to mean looking at how your ads are performing for you. And there are some really advanced features here that actually go a bit above and beyond what you would have access to with AdWords. We'll delve into these in more detail in the next video. But for now, make sure you're watching your basic metrics like a hawk. Click the Reports tab here and then standard reports over here on the left hand side and select any one of the 18 different performance reports to get your statistics. You'll be able to see things like your average CPC, your cost per click, your average CPM, cost per impression, CTR, click through rate and a whole lot more. So now you know how to run a Bing Ads campaign and you know why you should be running a Bing Ads campaign. But this doesn't mean you're done with Bing, not by a long shot, because you can still get more out of it by thinking about SEO as well. SEO for Bing has all the same benefits over SEO for Google that Bing Ads have over AdWords. That means less competition, slightly different market, 20 to 30% of the market share. And a lot of people will know all these things and still not do anything about it, which might leave you asking why not. Well, there is one more thing to consider here, and that's just how different Google and Bing really are. Because the assumption is you can probably focus on SEO for Google and then rest assured you'll gain more exposure on Bing too. So you can put your time and effort into the biggest search engine and know it's probably helping out on Bing too. 
as Google still has the biggest market share, that should still be a priority. It just doesn't make sense to turn it on its head. So, does this argument hold water? Just how different are Google and Bing anyway? Well, it's certainly true that a lot of your SEO practices are going to remain the same on Google and Bing. Both Google and Bing have the same end goal, and that end goal is to supply their users with beautifully made, high-quality content. Thus, they will use similar means to achieve those ends. Both look for sites with lots of backlinks, both as a way to find them and as a way to learn what they're about and whether they're held in high regard. Likewise, both will analyse the text on a site and look for the use of keywords. So writing content and building links are both activities that you should be doing, no matter which search engine you have in your sites. But there are certainly some differences too. So here's the thing, you don't have to focus on Bing at all. No one is asking you to ditch your efforts on Google, you know, that wouldn't be a smart business move. But if you understand how Bing works, then you can do a little of both. You can add in a few new techniques that you know will help your Bing ranking, or you can occasionally write a post for Bing. And this is just stuff that you should know. So let's make sure you know it. Before we look at SEO for Bing specifically, it makes sense to first look at SEO generally. Just what is SEO? How does it work? And what does it involve from a marketing perspective? Essentially, SEO means you're building your site to show up in the search results, the aforementioned SERPs. This is what we call an organic result. It gets the same overall effect as targeting a specific keyword with a Bing ad, except you aren't paying for it. Of course, this also makes it less guaranteed in so far as it might not work. You know, SEO is a lengthy process that's based a fair bit on luck. Essentially, SEO is performed by adding lots of great content to your website so that Google and Bing can identify the topic of your site and know which searches to show your links for. This content needs to be well written so that it will look better quality than the content from other sites. At the same time, it should use subtly inserted keywords throughout the text, the headers and the HTML tags so that the search engines can index it for the keyword you're targeting. Don't overdo this though, or you'll get penalized. The other main ingredient for a successful campaign is your backlinks profile. This refers to all the links around the World Wide Web that are pointing to your site. These are good for you because Google and Bing consider them references. You know, if a big site is willing to link to you, then it suggests that you must be a serious site in your own right. And this is another reason it's important to write high quality content. And it's a reason that you need to think about the quality of your links as much as the quantity. At the same time, having inbound links is important because it helps Google and Bing to find you in the first place. Both search engines use robots, these are small scripts, that search the web by following links. Once you're indexed, you'll be checked regularly. Until then, though, you're relying on links. Combining PPC with SEO is a match made in heaven for a number of reasons. For starters, gaining more traffic for your site is always going to increase your visibility in the SERPs organically because it will mean more people see your site and hopefully share it with others, thereby linking to you. This then improves your organic backlinks profile and it helps you to climb the ranks. At the same time, using PPC allows you to test out a particular keyword and see how it's likely to work for you and bring in more customers, or not. This can show you which keywords are worth putting in the work to try and rank organically for. Likewise, this also works in reverse, as we discussed earlier. You can see how your organic results are working for you and which ones are helping you to get actual customers. From there, you can see which keywords are worth spending money on. You can also use a combination of both PPC and SEO in order to cover a wider spread of keywords, thereby bringing more people to your site.
There are numerous advanced features and options you can tweak in order to get the very most out of your ads, and these can make a big difference to your campaigns and your profits. For example, there's negative keywords. Now, negative keywords allow you to add keywords that you want to ensure don't bring up your ads. Now, normally Bing and Google will show your ads based on very similar keywords, though Google does this more than Bing, meaning that if your keyword is fitness books, you might find your ads showing up on free fitness books. The only problem? Well, someone searching for a free fitness book probably doesn't want to pay $20 for a fitness book. So in this case, it would be pertinent to make free a negative keyword so that people looking for free things are excluded from your campaign. Then there are dynamic keywords. And dynamic keyword insertion allows you to automatically insert your keywords into your ad's title or text. This means that, for example, you could make it so people find whatever product they search for for sale or if they search hats, then you might show them buy hats online. Another neat feature of Bing is the ability to add ad extensions. This will allow you to add things like links to your site, locations on a map, or a click to call button. An ad extension means that, for example, you could get your customers to call you right from the Bing search results on their mobile. The site link is used to link people into deeper pages of your site, such as specific item listings in your store, for example. Targeting allows you to specifically target the type of person you want for your ads even more. By clicking Advanced Targeting Options, you'll be given the option to select your viewers by their genders and ages, that's based on their Microsoft accounts, by the device that they're on, perhaps if you're setting an app, you might want to target mobile devices, for example, and by schedule. Schedule is important because it means you can avoid wasting money showing ads at 3 a.m. in your local area. It also means you can get even sneakier and, for example, show ads only later in the evening. As it gets later and we become tireder, we actually become more impulsive and thus more likely to click buy on an advert. You can use Bing ads to set up goals and then see how customers are interacting with those goals. You may recall that we discussed goals in an earlier video in the context of Google Analytics. We also discussed how you could use these to identify the best keywords for your ad campaigns. Well, once you have your ad campaign set up, you can actually integrate your ads directly with your goals. This is a much more valuable metric than simply your average CTR, you know, your click-through rates, although that is still a useful measure. To set up goals, go to your campaigns and then click Shared Library and then Conversion Tracking. You'll need to get a UET tag. Now, this is a small piece of code that you'll put on your website to link it to your Bing ads. Just click here, get started on the page here where you uh, create your UET tag and follow the on-screen instructions. It's all uh, fairly straightforward. Then click conversion goals from the left-hand menu. And then click here where it says create conversion goal and once again follow the on-screen instructions. Once you've done this you'll be able to see how your ads are performing in terms of helping you to get the results you're looking for i.e. sales. This in turn will allow you to see which ads you should be spending more or less on and whether or not you're actually getting ROI from them. This will eventually allow you to calculate a specific CPA or cost per action, which means you're finding out more precisely how much it's costing you to make sales or get subscribers. You'll also be able to do a lot more tracking for your ads and looking around the dashboard will help you to find all kinds of useful options. For example, you'll be able to find your quality score for your ads by looking on the campaigns page. This gives you a score from 0 to 10 that will show how your ad is performing. You'll learn how high your CTR is compared with other CTRs for similar campaigns targeting the same traffic. 
Anything about seven is considered very competitive. Six is competitive and anything below is underperforming. If you have a blank dash where your score should be, it means Bing doesn't have enough information yet. Based on the success of your ads, you can then head over to Bid Adjustments, which does exactly what it says on the tin, and allows you to tweak your ads so that you're paying more or less per click. Internet marketers, meet Bing. Bing, meet internet marketers. Right, with the introductions out of the way, let's get you two acquainted. Point number one. Bing likes to take things literally. Bing is a bit like that slightly slow friend that you had in school who didn't really understand jokes. Or, to put it another way, as in AI, Bing is probably somewhere on the spectrum. Yes, taking things too literally is one of the most common criticisms leveled at Bing, and that's because it has a tendency to simply look for exact matches in the content. If you search for, I like to eat steak, then Bing will look for websites that have that phrase or something similar in the text. On the other hand, Google just looks for content about steak and about people who like to eat steak. In this way, Google shows a little more understanding and has more ability to read between the lines. Not that this is always a good thing, mind. Sometimes Google's second guessing can actually be a bit irritating and can lead to results that aren't directly related to what you're looking for. If you ask a question, for instance, then Bing will be more likely to bring up a page where someone else has asked the same question, and this can be very useful. But what it means for you is that it's still worth using some keywords. Whereas Google is much more about latent semantic indexing and writing around the subject, perhaps using some long tail keywords, you know, Bing will still reward you for including the very basic keywords that you're trying to rank for. So try and do a little of both. You'll want to use a slightly lower link density than you used to if you want to avoid being penalized for spamming by Google, but you should still include some keywords there for Bing. Point number two, user engagement matters. Something that Google and Bing can agree on is that user engagement matters. Except Bing is even more explicit about this, if anything, and has even coined a phrase to describe the activity they want to avoid. Pogo sticking. There will be none of this, thank you very much. Pogo sticking is when a website visitor jumps from one result, clicks back, and then clicks on another. This is what they want to avoid. So if you want Bing to love you, you need to prevent your visitors from wanting to click back. This means you need to grab attention early on, and it means that you need to think about your page speed, your design, etc. Point number three, so do click-through rates. Another similar factor that Bing also takes seriously is CTR, the click-through rate. In other words, how many people click on your link? So if they keep showing your website in their SERPs, but no one ever clicks on it, this suggests your site doesn't look very interesting. All it's doing is cluttering up the page and taking up space that another site could make better use of. This is quite a clever way for Bing to check that the results coming up are relevant, or that they seem relevant in the eyes of visitors. This is interesting because it's not something that Google talks a lot about, and improving your CTR is going to involve a rather different process compared with the SEO practices you're probably used to. What improves CTR? Well, many things, but of course the title and the meta description are going to be right up there. Think about what will be interesting for someone who is searching for the key phrase that you're trying to rank for. Make sure there is a direct connection here and have all the signals pointing to the same topic. And learn how to write engaging titles and descriptions. Point number four, social signals are big on Bing. There's some debate still as to the role of social signals on Google even now. We know for a fact that getting plus ones on Google Plus will improve your Google ranking, but whether the same is true for Facebook likes is less certain. And if Facebook was central to Google's strategy, then you might ask why BuzzFeed isn't the number one result for every search. 
But Bing has gone on record as saying that social signals do matter to them. And this means that you should definitely include social media marketing as part of your marketing strategy. Point number five, crawl depth. Going back to your site content and keywords for a moment, it's also interesting to consider the difference in crawl depth for Google versus Bing. Reportedly, Bing only crawls around the first 100 kilobytes of a web page, unlike Google, which will read your whole site. This means you should aim to include your keywords more heavily in the first portion of your content compared with the rest. And this actually makes a lot of sense for Google too, but for different reasons. Google actually looks at certain key points within your content as being more important indicators than others. The first paragraph is one section that's given extra importance, as is the last paragraph and other headings. And by increasing the keyword density in your first paragraph, you can send the right signals to Bing without getting too spammy with keywords for Google. You know, everyone wins. This also introduces some other interesting points too. For instance, a lot of people will rely on sitemaps in order to help search engines index their site. This is one page that links every other page on the domain, and it means that once the map is indexed, Google knows where to find all future content you add. But this won't work for Bing if it's only reading the top segment of the page. If you want your sitemap to work for Bing, you need to ensure that you put pages you most want to be found right at the top. And if you're adding new content, you want to make sure that new content goes at the top of any list rather than at the bottom. Point number six, respect your elder content. Bing believes in golden oldies. In other words, it believes that an older domain is more likely to be authoritative than a newer domain. So if you have a page that's been around for a long time, you'll find it gradually climbs up the rankings. This is one thing that's personally always put me off about Bing. Most of the research I do requires up-to-date and current answers. And that means I can't make do with posts from 2012. When I search on Bing, I'm often left wondering if anything I'm reading is relevant anymore. This is a personal preference, though. As far as SEO goes, it's actually a good thing. Why? Because it means that Google is going to like fresh content and Bing will give it some love as it starts to fade. But do bear in mind that both Bing and Google prefer older domains. Of course, there are way more differences than we have time to go into in detail. So let's look at some rapid fire differences to finish off. Bing likes keyword domains more. Google prefers brand name domains. Bing takes site authority very seriously. It likes editorial content, older domains, and established organizations. PageRank is less relevant for Google these days, and it's never been relevant for Bing. Bing likes content closely linked to a site's homepage, and it likes breadcrumbs. Another thing to take some time to learn is about Bing's spam filter, and this is how Bing decides whether or not to penalize sites that show up in its SERPs. So you need to make sure that you observe the rules that Bing recommends. This means being careful about your outbound links, you know, only link to clean sites, don't trade links, and use Bing's webmaster tools to find out if your site's been blocked. That's right. Bing has a webmaster tools just like Google does, and it's just as useful stroke invaluable for marketers. And you can find this at bing.com forward slash toolbox forward slash webmaster. As the Alan Parsons project sang, where do we go from here? Now you have lots of information about why Bing SEO matters, how it works, and how different it is from Google but you also know that you need to keep focusing on Google. So what's the best way to proceed? Well, exactly as we said earlier. For the most part, you're not going to do anything that differently, but you may want to consider including a few more keywords in your opening paragraphs. Maybe show a little more love to your legacy content and perhaps reorganize your sitemap. Oh, and definitely think about your titles, your meta descriptions, and how these factors will impact on your CTR. And in doing all that, 
you'll be throwing Bing the occasional bone that will help you to succeed a little bit more on the second biggest search engine in the world. And this will help you start tabbing into that 30% market share a bit more and hopefully improving your number of visitors. And if the Google apocalypse ever does come, at least you'll have a backup site that will still be bringing you fresh visitors and helping you to run your business. And then everyone else will find themselves wishing they paid just a little bit more attention to old number two. Oh, and one last thing. Why not go and take a look at your current rankings on Bing right now? If you haven't looked before, then it might surprise you just how similar or different the results are. At this point, you should now have a solid idea of what Bing ads are, how they work, and most importantly, how you can get them to work for you. But there is more to creating a successful campaign. You'll find that the more you work at it, the more you learn and the more you can keep honing your strategy to create better and better ROI. And here are some more tips and tools to help you do that. Bing Webmaster Tools is an immensely useful tool for monitoring both your PPC progress and your SEO on Bing. To get started, just head over to bing.com forward slash webmaster and sign in with your Microsoft account. You know, that's the one that you use to log into Windows. And you'll then be redirected to this page. And from here, you can add your site by putting it into this box and clicking Add. On the next page, you'll be prompted to add some details about yourself, you know, your name, your company name, etc. And then you'll be asked to place an XML file on your server to help Bing keep track of your site. And this will allow you to find out how your site is performing in searches. And you can combine this with your PPC metrics to get a more complete picture of your overall progress, your hits, etc, etc. Another useful tool that Bing offers is its SEO Analyzer. This is a tool that you can use to look at the SEO on your page. On-site SEO is also very important, meaning things like use of your keywords and your general coding practices, that sort of thing. It all, it all matters. It's all very important to Bing. And this uh, particular tool will analyze 15 different metrics, such as your H1 tags, your metadata, and more. And you can find it here at bing.com forward slash toolbox forward slash SEO hyphen analyzer. Want to bring your ads further up the SERPs? Here are some fresh tips from Bing's own site. First of all, increase your ad relevance. The more directly relevant your keywords are to your landing page, the more likely Bing is to show your ads high up. Bing goes on to suggest that you try to avoid gimmicks on your landing page and to be upfront with an interesting and clear product. This will help your conversion rates too, so it's very much worthwhile. You should also showcase specific content and talk to your customers in their language to create what Bing will see as effective ads. Increase your bid. Of course, the higher your bid, the better your chances will be of ranking high up in the SERPs. And here's one not from the site. Improve your Twitter followers. Bing has a close connection with Twitter, and this has allowed a feature where it can show the number of followers you have on Twitter next to your ads. This is called a social extension, and it's another place where Bing beats AdWords. If you're looking to promote your brand online, then the first place to look is to PPC campaigns. A PPC campaign is, of course, pay-per-click, and that means you pay each time a user actually clicks on one of your ads. There are several things that make this a fantastic way to generate traffic, which we'll look at later. For now, though, suffice to say that PPC gives you the precise control that any advertising campaign needs and allows you to build a perfect business plan with a precise advertising spend, target demographic, and profit margin. But when it comes to PPC, only one word will often come to mind. Google AdWords. Google AdWords is by far the biggest PPC platform and the one that most new marketers will go to first. But there are other options out there. And actually, 
focusing only on Google AdWords can be a big mistake for your campaign. We'll look in more detail at why this is in the coming videos, but suffice to say, Google AdWords is actually more expensive, more competitive and less precise in many ways. And this is where Bing comes in. Bing can help you reach an entirely different section of your market while avoiding direct competition with some of the bigger competitors in the field. As we'll learn, Bing can offer you the perfect back door and can even help your rankings on Google. It's the perfect starting point for the small, lean business and a very wise backup source of traffic for all online businesses. In this video series, you'll learn more about Bing and how it differs to Google. You'll learn why it's crucial to start paying attention to Bing and you'll learn how to take advantage of all its unique features. At the same time, we'll also be looking in depth at the best practices for creating successful PPC advertising campaigns on Google or Bing, and we'll see how this can be employed as part of a comprehensive business plan. Wait, before you get started, how would you like to get bigger ROIs and start making money with Bing ads even faster? First off, I want to personally thank you for purchasing the step-by-step -step guide to Bing Ads. You'll have profitable campaigns running in no time with what you'll discover inside the guide. But what if you could take a shortcut to success with PPC using Bing Ads? What if you could begin getting positive ROIs faster? And what if you could also get better results and make sure that you avoid the most common pitfalls people run into with Bing Ads? Although the guide you just purchased is written in a step-by-step -step format, many people learn much better by watching something done as opposed to just reading about it in a guide. That's because most people are visual learners. How about you? How do you normally learn the best? Would you rather read through a training course or would it be easier to get results if you could watch a video training that shows you exactly how to do it? If you're like most people, watching a video is far more effective than going through a text-based course alone. In fact, most people that get a text-based guide rarely get all the way through the training. And of the few people that do complete the training, very few actually retain what they read about. That means even if you finish the guide, you may not actually use what you just read about. That's a waste of your time and your money. But what if you didn't have to choose? What if you could get a complete video training course in addition to the text-based training guide that you just purchased? Something that will take you by the hand and give you that next level of training that you need to get big results with Bing Ads. That means more traffic, more conversions and bigger profits in your pocket. The good news is you're going to get the one-time opportunity to get your hands on a video upgrade to the course you just purchased today. At a big discount. I want you to start getting targeted traffic that converts like crazy as quickly as possible. That's why I've put together this powerful video upgrade to the guide you just purchased. You see, there are little details that can be the difference in seeing huge results with Bing ads and ultimately falling flat on your face and not making a dime in profit. Or even worse. If you do things wrong with Bing ads, you could even find yourself losing money. I don't want that to happen. This video upgrade makes absolutely sure you don't miss any important details when it comes to getting started with Bing ads, setting up your first campaign, learning how to handle targeting and create your ads for the best results, and ultimately knowing when to scale your campaign up and maximize your profits. If you miss even one step in the process of getting set up with your first campaign and running your ads, 
you could find yourself wasting a ton of time and ultimately missing out on sales or even losing money on ads that don't convert. When you follow what you'll learn inside the step-by-step -step video training, you'll ensure that you get success with Bing ads right out of the gates. Click the button below to get instant access. And, of course, as an existing customer, you'll get access to the upgrade with special, customer-only, discounted pricing. This is the next best thing to having a Bing Ads expert taking you by the hand and showing you how to get big results with Bing. Because this is so powerful, it will be easy to charge $500 or more for this upgrade. And it will be worth every penny. But you won't pay anywhere near $500 today when you make the smart decision to upgrade. And to make it even easier to get started with this upgrade today, you're also going to get an exclusive bonus of 10 high-quality audio MP3s of all the training. This makes it easy to learn on the go and get results even faster. When you add the MP3s to the 10 high-quality videos that show you how to see success with Bing ads, it's impossible to fail. And to make upgrading a complete no-brainer, you get to test drive this upgrade for the next 30 days. With absolutely zero risk. If for any reason, or no reason at all, you're not 100% satisfied with what you learn inside, simply send me an email and I'll refund every single penny of your tiny investment. No questions asked. But please don't wait. This is an exclusive one-time offer at pricing that's only available to my existing customers. If you wait, you may never get another chance to get access to this at a price this low. Click the button below to get instant access today. Whether you're interested in using Bing Ads or you're just thinking about doing more search optimization for Bing, it's time that you stop neglecting this search engine and focusing entirely on Google. Now, let's be honest, most of us don't really practice SEO, search engine optimization. We practice Geo, Google optimization. Google is the first and last word in internet marketing as far as a huge proportion of internet marketers and SEO agencies are concerned. It's time to change this way of thinking. But why? Why break the habit of a lifetime? Well, for starters, Bing has 20% market share. Well, that work you up, right? Many of us think of the search engine industry as being a one-horse race, but really that's not the case. 20% is actually a pretty decent chunk of the market. And when you consider that Yahoo still makes up around 10% and that Yahoo is powered by Bing, that number goes up to 30%. This is a serious amount of web traffic. Now ask yourself, in what other scenario would you be happy to let 30% of a market walk? If I told you that you could get 30% more visitors to your high street store by changing your shop name, you'd change it in a heartbeat. 30% of potential visitors means 30% of potential customers and 30% of potential profit. Instead of earning $50,000 a year from your website, you could be earning $65,000 a year just by paying attention to Bing. Now, that's a massive difference and for free holiday. And there are plenty more reasons to wake up to the reality of Bing as well. For starters, Bing is integrated with Windows 10. Windows 10 is the latest iteration of Windows from Microsoft, and it comes with being deeply ingrained into the system. What's more is that Microsoft says this is the last version of Windows ever. That is to say that future upgrades to Windows are going to be iterative rather than complete overhauls. So we can safely say that Bing is here to stay. 
not only is Bing the default search engine for the Edge browser, which comes with some pretty neat tricks up its sleeve, it's also the search engine used by Cortana. Cortana is a digital assistant like Siri that now lives on your desktop. If you want to find out the weather, for instance, you can simply ask Cortana, and while you're typing, she'll pull results from Bing and tell you. Bing has also recently made the transition to Android and iOS and is found nicely on your smartphone. This means that even if someone should set Google as their default search engine, they're still likely to be using Bing on their desktop without realizing it just by speaking with Cortana. If they ask, what does hypertrophy mean, Cortana will open up Bing and show the results in the browser. That could be your website that they're showing, you know. And the same is true if they own an Xbox One. We don't have the exact sales figures for Xbox One right now because Microsoft are remaining quite tight-lipped about them. But we do know that they're in excess of 25 million around the world. Xbox One comes with a lot of home entertainment functions, including a browser that you can use while playing games or chatting on Skype. And guess what search engine the Xbox One browser uses? While the Xbox One isn't quite the massive success that Microsoft had hoped for, you know, PS4 still has the lead in the moment, the company is still getting great reviews in all other departments and is generally considered to be firing on all cylinders at the moment. Examples of this can be seen with the success of Windows 10, the Microsoft brand, and the Surface line of hardware. Then there's the huge buzz surrounding the HoloLens. HoloLens is a piece of mixed reality hardware that might well introduce the world to a new form of computing. And guess what search engine it's going to use? Anything could happen in the next few years to upset the Apple cart and lead to Google losing market share. For example, Apple have repeatedly threatened to ditch Google as the default browser on iPhone, and this could very easily lead to a seismic shift for the search engine landscape. Then again, it might never happen. But the question is, can you afford to take that risk? Are you happy knowing that all your eggs are in Google's basket? And one last thing to consider is that Bing offers a lot of opportunity for the savvy SEO stroke webmaster. Why is that? Well, simply because Bing is lesser known and there are fewer people trying to rank there. Likewise, there are fewer people paying for PPC. That means you'll pay less per click and you'll find it much easier to get to the top of the SERPs. Specifically? Well, you'll pay around 33.5% less on Bing compared with Google AdWords. In real terms, that means 33.5% more traffic for the same cost. A lot of people never consider Bing SEO and they don't know what the key to succeeding there is. That means the 30% of traffic to be found there is ripe for the taking. It means you can do a little background research and then just swoop right in and get to the top of the SERPs, that's the search engine results pages. You'll be in a smaller pond, but it will be much easier to get the fish biting. And what you have to understand is this can lead to more knock-on effects for your Google ranking too. Think about it. If you get to the top of Bing, then that leads to a lot of exposure to 30% of the web. This in turn means that you end up landing more backlinks and getting discussed in more forums and more comment sections. The same goes for paying ads on PPC. You can use this as your way in to boost your position in Google SERPs as well as to generally increase your brand without directly challenging the biggest players in your niche. And apart from anything else, if you completely rely on Google for all of your traffic, you put yourself at risk of something going wrong when Google changes its policies, which it does all the time, or should something go wrong with Google itself. Look, this is a video about Bing ads, but that doesn't mean we have to be unrealistically biased towards Bing here. There are still plenty of good reasons to prioritize your Google AdWords campaign, the biggest being simply that Google AdWords lets you reach a bigger audience. But with that said, it makes a lot more sense to make sure that you're on both. The Google apocalypse may never come, but you should still have a contingency plan in case it does. Finally, 
think about the kind of person who is likely to be deeply ingrained with the Microsoft ecosystem, who is likely to use Microsoft software suites and hardware. Simple. Businesses. That means executives, CTOs, and managers. And that means they're also likely to be looking at Bing. If that's your target demographic, then you should strongly consider adding Bing ads to your campaign. There are more reasons why Bing might be a better choice for building an effective PPC campaign. For example, it's generally considered that Bing offers superior control over ad campaigns in some aspects. For example, Bing allows you to set different ad campaigns for different time zones, allowing for sophisticated ad scheduling strategies. And this can end up making an important difference to your success. As in comedy, timing is everything for marketing. Likewise, Bing allows you to set more things like location and language for each ad group rather than for each campaign. Bing also allows more precise device targeting letting you set different bids for different types of devices. It also lets you choose which search partners you want to work with, and it makes it easier to leave out variations of your search terms in order to create a more focused campaign. Oh, and on one little side note, Bing is actually much better looking than Google. Those daily features images really give Bing a relaxing and modern feeling, and the animated ones in particular can actually be reason enough in some cases to head on over to the site. Surely it's worth showing Microsoft some love for that. In this video, I want to show you how you can turn spam around on a spammers. I'm speaking about blog spam on your own WordPress blog. Okay, now, first of all, you're going to have to make sure that you have the Acusmet plugin installed. Okay, with that, let's go to plugins here, installed plugins. And in Askamet, when you go into settings, when you first set this up, you need to have a key. You can get the key from wordpress.com. So put your key in there. And once you have that, it's going to start picking up all the spam and it's going to delete it all automatically for you. So it's a great thing in that way. But here's how you can turn it around on the spammers. Let's just go back to my Acusmet stats again. You notice that, well, I'm getting progressively worse here, but I've had 380 spam this month so far, and almost all my comments are spam. Okay, so, so how can you turn this to your advantage? Well, you can make them legitimate comments. Let's go over to comments. Okay, and then let's go over to where it says spam. Okay, now Acusmet has already gotten rid of a bunch of these because it deletes them automatically. So you need to come in here every once in a while. And then you can go through any of the comments and see if any of them are any good other than where they've spammed you. Okay, you can see there's lots of links and everything else in here. But you go down and you find any that are okay. Okay, so here's one that we could use. Now, what we can do is we can say it's not spam. And then when we go up top, you'll see pending. Now, what you can do is you can go in and edit it. Okay, and then just take out the spam out of here. Okay, and then you can approve. So we'll set it to approved and update. Okay, and now we have a valid comment. They made the comment. All we did was take the spam link out. Now, of course, in settings and in discussion, you need to have this set so that an administrator must always approve the comments. That's why it went to pending status. Okay, so that's a little bit of a controversial way that you can use spam comments 
to add more comments to your blog. Now you might be wondering why you want to do that. Well, because it adds content to your blog and if they're decent comments, it adds some value to your blog. So that's how I use spam to my advantage.